Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm always quite scared when you speak to a group like this because you all have smartphones, which means that you have access to everything ever made in the world, your, your best friend's wedding pictures, every Oscar-winning film. So I have to try and be more interesting than everything that you could consume right now, which is quite challenging. And the way that I deal with that is by talking very quickly and by presenting lots of slides to you. So apologies for a, a pretty sort of high-tempo presentation. But today I'm going to talk about uh, sort of advertising trends and basically the future of media. So quite a kind of big topic. Um, my job is very much about understanding change. Like we live in a world where technology is making change faster and faster every day. Uh, and that pace of change is accelerating. And that means at some point in time, you'll look back on this moment and you'll be nostalgic about how slow, simple, straightforward things were. You'll kind of hark back to these simple times. Um, and we need to be wary when we look at change that not everything is changing. It's really easy to go out there and say everything is totally different, everything is changing, the world's going to be totally different. If you're selling coffee through grocery stores, you know, the, the idea that you're either a startup or a leave behind is not necessarily that true. Your business may, may maintain. So it's my job to sort of help our clients understand that change, understand what's not changing, understanding what the opportunities are and what the threats are. And I kind of do that by provoking a debate. Like, I'm only 37, so I don't really have any of the answers at all. Uh, but I've got some really good questions. So I write in various different publications, like TechCrunch, Advertising Age, The Guardian. Uh, and I talk a lot about the change in the world with the hope that people can come to me and say that I'm wrong. Uh, so this is presentation is just lots of beliefs that I have that I'd like you to talk to me about later on in, in little breakout sessions. The quote there on the right is something that I wrote for TechCrunch, which, which went viral and has been used quite a lot in presentations around the world. I was going to do a very boring presentation to do with media trends with, with data. And then talking to a few of you yesterday, you seemed way more interesting than that. So I thought I'd do something a little bit more punchy and profound. And I've never done this presentation before. So if I mess up halfway through, that's why. But I just thought I'd go for it and go big or go home. Um, now, in advertising, we talk a lot about change. We're, very, um, we're quite smug, you know, because Nokia didn't see the iPhone coming. Um, you know, blockbusters didn't see Netflix coming. And we like to think that we've made lots and lots of changes to make sure that we're not like that. And we talk about change a lot. But I profoundly believe that we've not changed anything like enough. You know, if you look at things like uh, pre-roll advertising, we celebrate this as being great digital advertising, whereas actually we've just taken TV ads and we've stuck them on the internet and we've called them pre-rolls. I know because I did some of the very first pre-rolls in the world, and you looked at the media plan and you kind of freaked out because we'd never seen this before, so we just sort of stuck the TV ad on there and hoped for the best. And no one's ever challenged that. Uh, this ad on the left here is from Coca-Cola from the 1770s. Uh, and most digital display ads looked remarkably similar. Uh, you can take something like a print ad from Coca-Cola from the 1820s, and you can stick it on into Instagram, and you can be very smug that you really understand social media and that you really understand mobile because you're doing something new. Actually, there hasn't been that much change. Uh, branded content, you know, the Ridge and Furrow magazine, I think, was from about 1893. Uh, if you do branded content today, people think you're very sexy and very future-focused. Whereas actually, we've been there before. You know, even the Michelin, the Michelin guides, I think, came from the 1900s. Uh, and finally, and I'm not trying to depress us all here, but finally, if you look at something like e-commerce, I mean, this is the Sears catalog, I think, from 1916 on the left-hand side. You know, modern websites don't look that different. So for a technology that's supposed to have changed everything, we well, haven't really changed that much. So this is the um, Olympic Games opening ceremony. I wasn't there. Um, but the idea here is about electricity. Because if you look at factories before electricity, they look like this. I think I've got a pointer. But you can see this kind of power belt going down the side. And then that sort of drives these belts here. And what drove this whole thing here was a big steam engine. And factories around this time were pretty efficient. Everyone was quite happy with them. Then electricity was discovered. And what they did is they changed this power belt so that it was powered by electricity. So after electricity, factories looked absolutely identical. And for several, several years, people were quite happy with that change because it was a little bit more efficient. It produced less pollution. They employed slightly fewer people in the turbine. But basically, nothing changed. So nothing changed, but everybody was happy. 
Now, about 30 years later, what people really realized that electricity meant was that everything was different. So the machines in the factory could be arranged in completely different ways. The factory could be located in completely different places. It could now be located near the ports or near the sources of labor rather than near the power supply. And everything changed. So if you took electricity and applied it to the existing structure, nothing really changed, although you felt like it did. Whereas if you reimagined the whole factory around electricity, everything was completely different. And I think that's a really good approach to think about advertising and to think about business in the modern era. Because at the moment, I don't know if this is a show in Germany, but our approach towards digital technology feels very much like Pimp My Ride, where what they probably need to do is buy another car. But what they actually do is they just put a really nice paint job on it. So it's a kind of veneer of progress. And I think that's very much how we're kind of operating in the modern time. So what we really need to do is kind of forget everything that's ever happened before in advertising. We need to kind of reimagine advertising based on this new criteria, based on everything being possible, and forgetting all memories. So I'm going to take you through, I think, seven themes which will help us do that. And I'm doing this really quickly because I've got no time, so I'm sorry that I'm talking so fast. So um, a new canvas with seven themes. The first one is the pervasive web. Now, I remember when you used to go online, it was like a place that you went to. You'd sort of wait for your sister to get off the phone. You'd sort of plug in a modem. You'd get the sort of intro music to the internet, which was that sort of scratchy tune. You'd go on the internet for about five minutes, and then you'd go offline, do something else, and you'd realize you'd forgotten to do something, so you had to go back online again. It was a real pain. It's not like that anymore. So if you speak to a 40-year-old and say, you know, how many, how many hours a day do you go online for? They'll say, yeah, a couple of hours. If you speak to a 16-year-old, they'll give you a slightly greater number because they're slightly more involved with the internet. If you ask like an 11-year-old, they'll just say what? Because for them, for there to be a concept of offline, there would have to be a concept of online. And it just doesn't really exist for them. So routinely in our industry and in all of our businesses, when we're talking about the internet like it's a thing, we should just forget that it's a thing and just think of it as the modern environment. Like e-commerce is just the act of buying stuff. The fact that it comes to people through a website is kind of irrelevant. And it's almost the same with mobile. Again, lots of retailers will celebrate their mobile commerce business. They're just buying stuff. It just happens to be the internet on a smaller screen. In fact, if you talk to people about their internet use, I don't know if you've seen this before, but there are many, many people in places like Thailand uh, and Myanmar who don't think they use the internet, but they definitely use Facebook. And I think that helps kind of explain the kind of the mental way that people are thinking about this. They're not thinking about the technology, they're just thinking about the stuff they get. And there are people like this, you know. So if you ask this guy what he's doing, he's probably going to say he's watching TV. But as a media agency, we have to look at that and go, no, he's totally wrong. He's not watching TV at all. This is a digital buy. And actually, he's probably right. Like, we need to start thinking more about people and less about the things that are important to us. Uh, and there are lots of devices like the Echo. I don't know if any of you have got this. But the internet is kind of weaving itself into our life. Like the internet is not being something that's in the background. It's something that's a kind of ambient, pervasive power around us. Uh, or things like the dash buttons are good examples as well. So the second thing is that screens are now everywhere. Um, we used to kind of label media channels after the physical device that we consumed them on. So a radio would obviously be a radio. A TV would be a TV. There was nothing ambiguous about that at all, whereas increasingly everything is just a digitally connected screen. So whether it's smart TVs, whether it's VR headsets, whether it's massive screens in cars like the Tesla, uh, whether it's screens in buses, this is Mumbai. I mean, this bus can barely get up a hill, but it's got an incredible sort of system of screens within it. Uh, retail is going to be completely dominated by screens. Uh, things like smart mirrors, uh, things like projected cookers. You just need to imagine a situation when pretty much every surface around us will become a digitally connected screen. So when we're thinking about advertising, we need to sort of forget these assumptions. If it's a digitally connected screen, that means that the images can move. That means that the ads can be bought in real time. That means it is the context that becomes more important rather than how things get to you. Things can be bought programmatically, and everything will be supplied digitally. OK. We're getting towards much more intimate screens and much more intimate data. So in the olden days, you know, if you wanted to watch something, you'd probably go to a movie theater, hundreds of people, miles away from a massive screen. 
and you had no control over it. There was no remote control. Uh, then we had the TV, slightly fewer number of people, smaller screen that you get closer to with a bit more control. Then we have laptops. This is how I always use my laptop. I don't know about you. Um, fewer people, uh, preferably your loved one. Even closer, smaller screen, and you now have access to everything. You can go anywhere you want in the world. And the sort of natural progression of this is to the mobile phone. So this is the smallest screen we've ever known. It's the most intimate. It's the most personal. We're closest to it. And this device is now incredibly um, connected. It's got sensors that know where we are. It knows what the weather's like. It knows how the stock market's performing today. It has access to the entire internet. Um, so these are the most intimate, most personal screens we've ever had. And if you're trying to connect with people, there's never been a better opportunity to do so. Now, this journey looks like it could carry on. So in theory, smartwatches become even smaller, even closer, even more personal. And then the kind of ultimate destination, according to this logic, would be VR. You know, my, my mum always used to tell me off for sitting too close to the TV. Um, so I don't know how she'll feel about a VR headset on my face. Um, and if you think people look stupid on public transport staring at their phones, imagine how it's going to look like if your whole carriage is full of people like this. Um, number four from seven. Uh, we're more mediated, so we just consume a lot more media in our life. Sometimes we're doing three things at the same time. Um, this is my only chart, but I love it, because we think that everything is different right now and that media is really complex. Whereas, actually, if you take all media that we consume today and if you separate it only as mobile media and non-mobile media, the amount of non-mobile media we consume each day actually remains quite similar. There are subtle changes in it where we watch slightly less TV, we consume slightly less print, but broadly speaking, it's flat. The big thing that's happened to our lives is that we've got this massive excess of media in our life that's come to us from the mobile device. Because what's happened is every single chance you get to check your phone, people basically take. So if you're waiting for an elevator, you instinctively now take out your phone. Once you get in the elevator, you then look at your phone again. It doesn't really make any sense, but that seems to be how we're all behaving. And as I travel around the world, that seems to be consistent wherever I am. Whether it's a small regional town in Oxfordshire, whether it's South Korea, we're just staring at our phones the whole time. Sometimes I get really tired, and I'm in the living room, and I'm looking at my phone, and I think, oh, I need to go to bed now. And I'll go to bed, and I'll check my phone again. Completely nonsense. Um, and therefore, you get pictures like this. I was in South Korea at the weekend. And the entire carriage is just full of people looking at their phone. There were 55 people, 54 of them were staring at their phone, and one of them was listening to music through their phone. Um, and our phone's becoming our gateway to everything. Um, so there are millions of apps that I can tell you all about. But the main essence is whether you're trying to change your central heating, change your music, change your lighting, feed your plants, uh, open the door to your house. Increasingly, the phone is becoming the gateway to everything that we do. The fifth one is quite hard to do quickly, but the idea here is the internet is becoming thinner and more proactive. So in the olden days, you would search for information and it would come to you, whereas increasingly apps are running in the background and information pops up to you as and when you need it. Uh, so this is Dark Sky. I don't know if any of you have tried it, uh, but it runs in the background of your phone. You never ever see it's there. And then if it's going to rain, it sends you a little message saying, Tom, it's about to rain. It's not quite perfect, because for some reason it always thinks I'm in New York. So sometimes I'll be in Berlin, and it'll tell me it's just about to rain in New York, which is not that helpful. Um, but the idea here is of bits of information that kind of nudge you. And um, increasingly, our internet experience is one of these, these experiences that come to us. So things like instant messaging are becoming like a new portal, where rather than surfing around lots of different apps, all of this information is bubbling up to us. Um, increasingly, it's going to be our way to book things like taxis, book hotels. Um, there's notions of anticipatory computing. So Google now will start figuring out what you're likely to do next and then offer suggestions to you. Again, advertising used to be about creating demand. New technology is about telling you things that you didn't even know you wanted. Um, and the kind of ultimate combination of this for the moment is very much in this bot landscape, where if you add together the technology of instant messaging plus artificial intelligence, you're now able to get really crappy customer service through an automated system of bots. Uh, and we've got technology like Cortana, Siri, 
uh, Alexa, Google Now, these are all anticipatory devices that are giving you messages as and when you need it. And my last chapter, the storefront is everywhere. So we used to assume that you went to shops, whereas now, thanks to our mobile devices, we can buy absolutely anything whenever we want. There are ads that you can now buy things directly from with a Buy Now button. Uh, we have technology like Touch ID, which knows your address, it knows your credit card details. There's no reason why you can't buy a single thing from every single ad that you see just by pressing your fingerprint. And things like the dash button are fascinating. So the general kind of theme here with the last topic is that the storefront is now everywhere. So you can now buy anything at any moment in time. The purchase funnel has gone from awareness down to purchase. It's now been reduced to pretty much a single decision. So I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, that's my Twitter handle if you want to follow me. I do like a monthly newsletter, and that's my email address if you want to ask me any questions. But thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>